as you know, as, as a country, as a people, we'll have certain holidays, right? Uh, maybe it's Thanksgiving. Uh, maybe it's uh, Memorial Day, like we just had. Sometimes it's one particular day. Sometimes it's longer than that. Sometimes it's a whole month. And we just happen to be in one of those. Um, the, the month of June... Uh, is known as, as Pride Month. And, and I wanted to talk a little bit about this, um, a, a little bit of the history. It was in, in 1969, and there was a, um, a, a gay bar called the Village of Stonewall Inn. And at that time, it was illegal, and so the police department raided that, that bar. And they had done that several times before in that community, several bars. But at this particular time, uh, the, the, that community kind of fought back and protested for several days. And so the, the following year, they kind of celebrated that anniversary and they, they had a march for that. And then the following year in 1971, at that point, several cities throughout the world were... Um, honoring that and having their own march. So if, it goes all the way back to, to 1970 and 71, and then, of course, here we are today, and uh, we have this Pride Month. And it's, it's meant to basically honor, and as one man says, we have an obligation to honor that community and to realize how, how far we have come. Um, it's also during this month that you'll typically see maybe like a, a, a rainbow bumper sticker or maybe a, a rainbow flag in someone's yard or their business uh, showing support. And uh, there's a little bit of history behind why the rainbow. And it was around, I believe, 1978. And uh, there were a couple of men, uh, both uh, part of that uh, community. And one had asked the other if he would create a flag. And coincidentally, this individual had been thinking about this on his own a couple of years prior. And he would realized how powerful the American flag was and, and how it brought people together. And so he thought it would be good to have a flag for that community. And so they did. And he thought that the, the rainbow was very appropriate because kind of like that community, it covers a whole range, you know, a range of colors. Well, with that community, it's, it's all races and, and all ages and all, and all sex. And so, and from their point of view, and it was very natural and it was very beautiful. And so the rainbow flag was, was chosen. Um, I'm talking about this because this week we had to restrict a couple of our kiddos' channels because they had videos on the kids' channels explaining uh, what the rainbow meant, and I didn't want my children seeing that. And so I would like to talk today and compare rainbows. I want to talk about the rainbow and its history. And yes, we're going to talk about, um, you know, I got to be really careful, right? You can tell I'm being careful because the little ears in here. Um, it's, it's, a fine, it's a fine line to walk, so, so be patient with me on this one. But I want to talk about the sin, but then I want to talk about what is our responsibility in our lives dealing with this? What are our attitudes? And I think that's really important for us. And I also want to go ahead and just say something um, right off the bat that... Um, I have no desire for any cheap shots or, or any snide remarks, okay? Uh, I think that would be very out of line. Uh, and I'm, I, I try to be very respectful because there are so many who have, who have to hit this face head on. And our response and our attitude has an impact. And it says something about us, okay? And I, I know you know that, but I want to go ahead and, and state that. The history um, behind Jehovah's Rainbow... So you remember in Genesis chapter 6, I'm going over this kind of quickly, how God ends up looking at his creation. Do you know that, and depending on which translation you use it, it literally says that God's repented of 
creating mankind. He regretted, isn't that sad? You don't typically hear this kind of thing from God. And this is just earlier on in Genesis. But he's looking down and he actually regrets making. Why? He says, because their thoughts were continually evil. It's just evil. But yet here's this man, Noah, and he finds favor in the sight of God. And so what happens is that God communicates to Noah. He says, I'm, I'm going to just utterly wipe out all living creatures, but, but not you. Not you and your family. And so he gives him instruction about this ark that he is to build and the animals that he's supposed to secure on the ark. And so Noah prepares this ark and he obeyed the Lord and all the things that God had told him. And so the day comes and can you imagine life was just going on and then begins dropping from the sky. The heavens release their fury, if you will. They release their waters. Also, it talks about the fountains are opened up. So God, and, and listen, and, and it's brutal. It's, it's, there's no way to sugarcoat this. It's the wrath of God. He's, he's flooding his creation from top to bottom. And, and he, he does it straight for 40 days and 40 nights until finally the, the tallest mountain is covered with water. And it takes a calendar year for the waters to return and for the dry land to, or for the land to dry. And then Noah is released, he and his family and the animals from the ark. And now we come to the covenant in the rainbow. I'd like to read this portion with you. We're in Genesis chapter 9, verse 8. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said... The sign, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I've set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. <coughs> Excuse me. This is an unconditional covenant that God made with Noah and his descendants forever. We can all say we all come from Adam and Eve, and that's true, but you got to go through Noah first whenever you trace it back. Noah and his family, there they are, and they begin to multiply. But that promise was an unconditional covenant to him and to his descendants forever. There is a powerful thing that happens whenever it rains. You know, we, we I, I, sorry, I forget this and I don't appreciate it. Happened just the other day, a beautiful rain, and I looked in the rearview mirror, and there's that beautiful bow in the sky. And our God sees that all the time. It's always raining on his earth, and this little prison, this little thing happens, and he sees it and he remembers, not going to do that. Whenever you see that rainbow in the sky, does it make you think about God's power? Amen. Does it make you think about his authority? Amen. But it makes you think about his goodness. It makes you think about his mercy. It makes you think about his grace. It makes you think about his faithfulness. However, I think it's also fair to say but that doesn't mean that you're supposed to forget what, why that came to be. <laughs> and, and it doesn't mean, as a Bible student, that God just, he's just not upset ever, ever again. <laughs> and you know what, now he's just like, whatever, agree to disagree, I'm just, I'm not going to punish anyone evermore. No, 
I mean, we learn that the reality is, is that he has a wrath for an ungrateful people, and it, it will be poured out one day. There is a judgment that's going to come. That, that's a reality of God. And Romans chapter 2 confirms this. And Paul is saying, and just be careful, do not think that because you wake up today and that you see sin or hypocrisy specifically going on, that God has just overlooked that. He goes, no, actually it's the goodness and it's the kindness of God hoping that you will, what? Repent. It, 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 it's hard seeing what, what we've done with the rainbow, you know? And, and, and this is a sin. I, 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 whenever God destroyed the world, there wasn't one particular sin. He's looking at mankind and they're just totally wicked. He said every thought is wicked. Um, but more specifically, in the month of June, no, I cannot say this is something we should be proud of as, as a nation. Um, we should blush as a nation at this. Th this has always been an issue with God, what we're talking about. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, you remember this. God visits Sodom. Angels visit there. You have Lot. Lot had departed from Abraham, and he went in the direction of Sodom. It was a beautiful land and place, okay? And he went to Sodom. Whenever these angels, whenever these men come into town, he, as you should, acts as a very benevolent individual, very hospitable to take care of them. The community, the men of the city of all ages come out, demanding them to know them. You know this account. God has enough with Sodom and the surrounding cities and he destroys them. You remember that biblical account. Matter of fact, one of you for the first time read this this past week and we were talking about it. You were blown away by this whole scene. It's, it's, it's a rough one to read. I want to point something out. I've heard even within the church that we've missed the mark with this, that really God had an issue with Sodom, not because of what you're reading in Genesis 19, but because they just weren't a hospitable people. This is taken from the passage in Ezekiel 16. God is rebuking Jerusalem. I want to read this for you. He says, And your elder sister in Samaria, who lived with her daughters to the north of you, and your younger sister, who lived to the south of you, is Sodom with her daughters. <laughs> Not only did you walk in their ways and do according to their abominations, within a very little time you were more corrupt than they in all your ways. We, kind of, we forget this passage. It, it shows you the state of God's people. As I live, declares the Lord God, your sister Sodom and her daughters have not done as you and your, daughter, uh, as you and your daughters have done. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. They were haughty and did an abomination before me, so I removed them when I saw it. Let, let me, can I say a couple things about this passage? Number one, there is a lesson to be learned. Don't just focus in on one kind of sin. You, let's take note that their excess of food and prosperous ease yet didn't help people. God also said that is, a, and what's the word? An abomination. He says, that was an abomination to me, and you were punished for this. But brethren, to isolate Ezekiel 16 without acknowledging Genesis 19 and what they clearly understood in the New Testament as we see it in Jude 5-7 is not being intellectually honest. Listen, Jude put it this way where he's warning against false teachers. Now, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So this inspired author is also letting you know 
some of the issues that God took with them. And it had to do with sexual impurity, unnatural desires. Um, God's always been really clear about this. Whether it was the Mosaic Law, uh, I've got the two passages here, you shall not lie with the male as with the woman. Uh, it is an abomination. If a man lies with the male as with the woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. And it goes into other instruction. God did not want men acting like women. He did not, like, he did not want men dressing like women. Um, our God did make mankind in the image of God, and he made them both male and female, and we do have different roles, and there are differences about us. Um, and that's not a jab. That's, that's the way that Jehovah God has made us, okay? Um, and he did not want us acting in that way. The, the marriage bed can be filed in many ways, and that's, that's one of them, okay? We are reminded that it is a hallmark of a culture departing from God. Whenever Paul is writing to the saints of Rome and he begins to show the downfall of a people, it starts with them, first of all, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Okay? So men begin to suppress. There's truth. It's not that it can't be known, but they don't, they don't want to acknowledge it. They suppress it. Uh, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly to perceive ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. I always kind of put it this way. You can run from God, but you can't hide. And whenever you go out and you look at creation, you, you know, and for, for those of us who know Jehovah God, you know that not just there is a God, but that Jehovah God created that. Okay? And I think that's Paul's point. So they're without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. So you take the truth, you suppress it, you don't honor him, and you don't give thanks to him, and you become futile in your thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. So now we're getting into idol worship. For images resembling mortal man and his birds and animals and creepy things. Therefore, in one of the scariest ways that God punishes the people, it says God gave them up. Three times in this text, it's just that God just, he gave them up. So, therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Paul pins, amen. For this reason, God gave them up. He gave them up. In other words, he let them go. And here's the kind of things that they did. Up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to na nature. It even talks about the Greek as the idea of instinct. It's even going against instinct, okay? Exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave them gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Um, we've tried to get around this, even in the religious realm, unfortunately, by saying, well, the real sin of this is that it was a forced relationship. It, the, the Greek does not support that. The translations are clear. It's with one another. These, these were agreeable acts between women and women, men and men. Okay. It, it's, it's been clear from a biblical standpoint that God's not happy about this. Okay. So, so you know this. So, so what's our part? Because, you know, you're, you were probably working last week and you, or the week before and you get some, some email from your company maybe about this. Because your company is supporting this? How, how do you deal with that? You know, what do you do? What do you say? If you're talking to someone, how, how do you do Like, this is real, and I'm seeing, like, people, like, shaking their heads. Yeah, this is real time now. <laughs> you're working with someone, and they engage in this behavior. 
you got a family member, and they engage in this. What do I do? Get after them. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Does God take issue with this? He does. But let's consider some principles here. First of all, no one is a part of this. So I wanted to share a couple of these passages. Whenever Noah was around, he preached. He talked to others. Okay? For Christ also severed once for sins the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. <coughs> When we went through our study on Peter, I gave you my, my understanding of this passage. And that it is accredited that Jesus is preaching to those spirits in prison, but through Noah at that time when he was preparing the ark. I believe what he's talking about is that Noah was preaching to these people in prison. Now in prison. He was preaching to those in those days that he was building the ark. Well, let's just be clear. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, if he did not spare the ancient world, this again is talking about false teachers, but notice something here. But preserved Noah a what of righteousness? A herald of righteousness, a preacher of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Okay, I just want, he was preaching. One of the things that, that, that I don't want to shy away, should I just never say anything? No, no. Don't, don't get the idea that you shouldn't say anything. If you love someone, you're going to preach to them. Listen, I don't know for sure, but I just wonder, I wonder if we end up finding Noah drunk after the flood because he's having a hard time dealing with all the death that he just saw. Oh, I wouldn't lose any sleep over it. Well, because you're not Noah, <laughs> apparently. You know, isn't this a tricky balance because... Should this, should sin offend, offend us? It should. Should this bother you? It should. Listen, I will tell you, whenever I saw that I couldn't, I had to block a kid's channel from, from listen, yes, it bothered me. <clears throat> but do I, but do I love other people? Well, I don't know. I guess my question is this, God, did God love you, Sean, whenever you went your own way and you were in the dark and you did abominations? Yes, he did. He did. And, and we need to preach boldly. What boldly means is that you say the thing. Sometimes whenever we think boldly, we think like harsh. You can be bold, but not be harsh. For example, here's Paul when he's left in Rome now, imprisoned. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him. Proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Right? He writes to the saints at Rome, Romans 15. But on some points I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God. I look at the grace of God and I, I, I mean, I don't want to be the judge of those kind of things. I don't want to say anything. Paul says, here's the thing. Whenever I look at the grace given me by God, I, I turn around and I preach boldly. And that means that I had to say some things to you, brethren, to the saints at Rome, that, that were hard to say, sure. But, but I was bold in this way because of the grace given me by God. See, I, I got to. I've got to say this to you. And we need to be clear about what we're saying. Um, Colossians chapter 4, 3 through 4. At the same time, Paul wrote, Pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the world, for, for the word, to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. So hear me something. I, I'm not going soft on you here. No, you, you need to talk to people. And you need to be courageous and be willing to say what needs to be said. And you need to be clear about it. But you also... <laughs> need to have wisdom and you need to speak with gentleness and you need to speak respectfully 
But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, see, when you teach and when you're bold and you're clear, by nature, people get kind of upset at you. If, if you've not had anyone upset at you in five years, <laughs> well, I'll let you finish that one. Okay, have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Sometimes people don't ask us about the hope that's within us, because they've never heard about the hope that's within us, or maybe they're not, oh, I don't know, maybe they're looking at how we're looking at our, uh, looking at our lives, and they've really got no question to ask us. But people who love God are a good kind of people, and we talk about the hope, and we live the kind of hope, and that we're the kind of people that others care, they, they're interested, and so they want to talk to us. You know, we always go to how we're supposed to answer, but I don't want to brush over that. You're the kind of person that person is intrigued. They want to talk to you. So when you open up your mouth, you're going to do so with gentleness and respect. With love. Paul says, rather speaking truth and love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is ahead in Christ. Now, in that context, he's talking about the body. But here's my question. If the body is supposed to, treat, to talk to each other and teach each other, speak the truth in love, shouldn't we do that to outsiders? I, I believe so. I mean, if I'm, if I'm treating others that way and talking to them, here's my logic. They're thinking, well, if they're treating and talking to me that way, I wonder if their little spiritual family's that way. <laughs> but even if not, even they go, well, they're good to each other, but not us, that's not right. Thoughtfully. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. I'm not trying to be funny here, but I, I really am trying to make a point here. You ever heard, heard a guy when he's talking about this issue say, well, last time I checked, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And they get, you know, you'll get your little chuckles. But let me tell you something. That's not, that's not being thoughtful. That's not being thoughtful. You got your chuckles from your crew, but you didn't give thought about how that was going to be received by someone who's maybe struggling with this. So let your friend pat you on the back, but don't look on the, uh, for God for the pat on the back. You're representing him. Persuasively, we are trying to persuade people. So I read this earlier, how you ought to make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Now the latter part, walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that may, you may know how you ought to answer each person. What is our goal? To win people over. Whenever Paul was before Ag Agrippa in Acts 26, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. A absolutely. You and everyone else, except for I don't want you to be in bondage. And you know what I would say? Our goal is that we want everyone to come to him, but we don't want them to be in the chains anymore. The spiritual chains that Satan has on them. Listen, most people that are caught up in this are struggling. They're struggling. And we need to be thoughtful. Sean, have you heard the studies about the percentage of, is it really instinct is it are you born with it all those discussions these questions that were asked Sean have you heard of those I have have you heard of the studies about twins and I, guys <laughs> whenever you're talking to someone who's struggling with it maybe put that one on the back burner for a moment 
Because going round and round on those things isn't helping in the moment. It, it's, it's like arguing with someone who's addicted to alcohol, but do you really want to drink it? <laughs> They're wanting to drink it. What we're trying to do is trying to reach out to a people to show them that ultimately there's something deeper going on. But we're finding a need and trying to find fulfillment in a physical realm. But the reality is a spiritual hole that can only be filled with spiritual things. And being harsh and being unloving is not going to get the job done. We don't care how other people are dealing with it. And quite honestly, I don't care how your brother in Christ may be dealing with it. I'm interested in how am I dealing with it. How are we dealing with it? You want some truth talk? I, when I was working in the bank, I worked with one man who was homosexual. <laughs> and then I worked with some other people that gossiped all the time. I had an easier time to go to lunch with him than I did, did, did them. Sorry. And he was a really good employee, by the way. Now, there are a couple of times where he flirted with me on purpose just to try to get under my skin. But you know what? He's kind of going through his thing, just like I've had to kind of go through my things. It's not good in the U.S. right now. It's not good. This is picking up steam. I remember reading articles, literally, that they were saying all the way back in the 70s, like, we can't just come out with this. This has to be introduced a little bit at a time. And, I mean, it makes sense. And that's what, that's what happened. And here we are now. And, and I face this with you because there are times to where, you know, I'll just say it. Like, when I saw that on the TV and I was having to restrict the kids, I was angry. Did I say that before? Sorry, let me be specific. I was angry about it. I was angry. I shouldn't have to be doing this. I don't know why companies have to get into the politics of this. Just, do you have a product? Just sell your product, man. I don't know why your bosses have to feel, but you know what? That's all, but, but it is, but it is. And there's no running from it. We need to give people hope. After that passage where it talks about Noah preaching to others, and now it goes into the 321. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul wrote, and here it is, Paul wrote to the saints in Corinth, listen to this, or do you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. Let me pause there. They try to say that, in the, in the, that the idea here is that men that weren't, weren't committed in a relationship or in a marriage. No, that's just fornication. No, it's it, the Greek specific. So there it is nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, don't look, you've already read, but how many of you know to go to 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to show people that homosexuality is condemned? What's the next passage? What's the next passage? Sorry, this is weird, but I'm blocking this. God just said, I don't want to talk to you. If you see them, get to the other side of the road. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. In the name, Jesus didn't want to have anything. To, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. God didn't say, we don't want to have anything to do with things. The whole Godhead says, we're getting in there and we're cleansing. So, should I talk to, to my employer? Who, yes, you should talk to them. Should I go to lunch? 
Jesus ate with, oh, say it. Jesus ate with sinners and tax collectors. Love on them. And then if it need be at time, if it doesn't go well, well then, defend, defend, fight for the faith. But still, even then, do it with love. Thank you so much for, for your attention. May God bless us as we continue to go through this and as we mold to the image of His Son. If you need to respond to the gospel, come.